Hello, Real World Clinicians. This is Ali Nasser with another Real World presentation for you. I'm joined today by Dr. Shafiq Safi, Real World Endo faculty from Montreal, Canada. Dr. Safi is an endodontist and educator. He's the founder and director of Centre Endodontique Saint Laurent and is also adjunct assistant professor and lecturer at the University of Pennsylvania and McGill University. Uh, Dr. Safi, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Dr. Safi, you have a very interesting presentation for us titled Apical Sizes in Modern Endodontics, Large, Small, or Adequate. Now, this is a topic that I'm asked about on a daily basis. What master file should I use in this tooth? What master file should I use in that root? Uh, and so on and so forth. So I'm very interested in hearing what you have to say about this. Now, judging from your title, Large, Small, or Adequate, I would assume that your uh, preference is adequate, right? <laughs> I mean, of course. I mean of course, it, it, it's a new term that I would like to uh, maybe get it going, hopefully, in, in, uh, in the endodontic world. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm Absolutely. an adequate guy in general. <laughs> I'm, I, that's, I can attest to that for sure, uh, even beyond adequate. So uh, let me uh, give you the podium here to get started. We're all anxious to hear what you have to say about this very important topic. So please go ahead. Thank you. So as you said, Dr. Nase, uh, it's a very uh, debatable uh, topic and it has been for a very long time. But before we start talking about all, like what size we should be finished, we have to revisit a bit the basic of endodontics. And for example, in uh, the basic of endodontics, or the goal of endodontics is really the prevention and the treatment of apical periodontitis. When you look at this picture on the left-hand side, we have a necrotic tooth, and we really know now today with all the works by Kakehashi, by Moller, and all these great guys that did the basic and the research that it's the bacteria that are invading the root canal system that cause apical periodontitis. And today what we have in our armamentarium of every day as the clinicians, are really our instrumentation and irrigation, or what we call more, uh, combined uh, our biomechanical instrumentation to be able to try to get rid of these bacteria and to restore the health in, into the tooth and into the periapical areas. So before we really talk again of, of, uh, of uh, apical sizes, there are three biological points or three important points that I would like to visit, which will lead us to the final answer of our question, what size should I take my, my, uh, my, my canals to? The first biological principle is the root canal anatomy itself, as illustrated on the left-hand side of the slide. In the middle picture is the second biological point I would like to talk about, which is the bacterial infiltration into the root canal system and into the dentinal tubules. And on the right-hand side, what I want to mention also is the irrigation. We want to make sure that we are able to deliver our irrigant to a decent working gland where our irrigant can take its, its effect and, and exert uh, uh, it, its antimicrobial properties. So talking about the first point, which is the uh, anatomy of the root canal system, we know by the works of Hess uh, in 1925, what he did is that he just injected ink into uh, various teeth, then he took various slices and he looked at them under light microscopy. And what we see are, are very, what he saw was very shocking in that the root canals are not round like what we thought, but they're like fins, webs, networks, connections, uh, curvatures, and like long diameter or large diameter. So it's not just like a tunnel or a canal going straight from a start point to an end point. And in 1955, there's a very famous uh, study by uh, Yuri Cutler. And uh, what he did is that he kind of um, investigated the measures or how big or how small are the apical constrictions or the apical diameters of the teeth. So on the left hand side we have a, a picture of one uh, that, uh, that appeared in the article of Cutler in 1955. And when I was doing this presentation I said wow this really looks like one of the pictures that has showed which is uh, uh, illustrated in the middle uh, of the picture. And when I looked into the apical area of, this, uh, of the root of the smaller like we see here, we really see that the uh, apical constriction picture of uh, Cutler on the left hand side really is very similar to Hess's picture. And so I said, okay, I'm going to apply whatever you uh, Cutler showed in, uh, into Hess's picture. And what Cutler showed is that there are kind of two diameters. I know we know today there's like the minor apical diameter and the major apical diameter. The minor apical diameter around was around an average of 0.27 to 0.3 millimeter, depending on the age of the patient. And the uh, the uh, the major apical diameter was between 0 0.5 to 0 0.68 millimeter, depending on the age of the patient. In other words, 
if you really want to clean the apical part of the tooth, and we know today from various studies that the level of your instrumentation and obturation should finish about 0.5 millimeter from the major apical foramen or about the apical constriction or about the minor apical foramen. You know, these all terminologies, hopefully one day I'll, I should, uh, I'll be able to, uh, to uh, talk about it in another podcast. If you want to finish your, present, your, uh, your uh, instrumentation at, a, at apical constriction, you have to make sure that maybe you're using something that will touch the walls. Maybe in this case, a 0.3 millimeter uh, uh, diameter, you need at least 30, if not bigger, to be able to really cut around the dentin to be able to clean this area. So we're talking already about a size 30. So when we look at this slide, and we have, let's say, a perfect round canal, for example. Let's take a perfect row. And you are putting in a small file. And after instrumentation, and when your instrumentation finishes, this small file will leave around her a lot of bacteria inside the walls, as we see. So you want, so you want to tend to take maybe a bigger file. So when you take a bigger file, this file will probably clean better because it's going to touch, it's going to scrape, and it's going to scrub, it's going to cut the dentine that's infected with the bacteria, and so it will be able to bring the microbial load to a decent level whereby we can promote healing. Now, this is all in a perfect round tooth. But I just said that, you know, it's very rare that we have a perfect round tooth. And in a very recent study by Wu, he investigated the prevalence of long oval canals. And what he found is that, for example, in the maxillary area, when you look, when he sliced his teeth at one millimeter from the apex, then premolar that had single canals, 38% of them had long oval canals. At a two millimeter level from the apex, the second mesial buccal canal, or the famous MB2s that we are all, you know, always trying to find, 73%, almost three quarters of them, had long oval canals. And at three millimeter from the, uh, from the apex, 60% of single canals, mesial buccal canals, had, had uh, long oval canals. So in the mandibular uh, teeth, Lower uh, incisors, for example, at two millimeter from their apex, 50, more than half of them, 55%, have long oval canals. And we have a lot of oval canals, for example, in the mesial buccal canals of lower molars, about 30% of them, three millimeter from the apex, and 24% of distal canals, one millimeter from the apex, are in a long oval canal shape. And we look at the one and two and three millimeters, and we know that the apical part of a canal, this is where like, the, it's the most important part to clean. This is where the bacteria and all their toxins are all concentrated. So if you're not able to really clean effectively, we are not giving all our best to be able to have a success at the long, at the long run when we do a root canal. So looking at this demonstration or at this animation, we have a long oval canal. And when we, let's say, treat it, <coughs> excuse me, with a small size or like size that is smaller, we tend to see that almost all the canal walls haven't been touched. And so we try to say, okay, well, we're going to take a bigger file that's going to maybe try to encompass or to include all the canal, keeping in mind also that this is a long oval canal. Now, what we see, if we took a big, if we take a big file, we're going to destroy the tooth. So we have to develop some kind of technique or some kind of strategy to be able to adequately clean and treat this canal. And the best way today is to treat this canal as two separate canals and take these two, let's say, separate canals to an adequate apical size, which in this case, we'll talk in a second, for, uh, for the lower uh, teeth, for example, should be about 35 or 4, for example. Now, having said, having looked at this, Let's look at uh, some studies that really show us how, how the bacterial reduction is affected by the uh, progressive filing of the teeth. And Chuping in 2000 did a very good study whereby he compared his uh, protocol to a protocol that was done in 98 by Dalton. And the protocol is the same, meaning they took the, uh, they took the um, uh, lower uh, molars, the mesial buccal canals, and single rooted premolars. And they progressively filed these canals. Let's say S1 is size 1, S2 means size 2, S3 means size 3, S4 means size 5. And they, and they counted how much bacteria was left after each size. The difference between the two studies is that Dalton used saline for irrigation and Chuping used sodium hypochlorite for irrigation. 
And what we see is that there's a steady decrease in bacterial load from S1 to S3, where both of them meet. So from size 3, which is a size 25, to a size 4, which is a size 35, the bacterial reduction was significantly different, which means that when we take our final instrumentation to a size 35, we are promoting the bacterial reduction in a very significant way that on the long run will probably promote a higher success, a higher chance of success than only, let's say, stopping at size 25. And not only that, what this study also tells us is that as long as we're only instrumenting to a size 25, our sodium hypochlorite might not have any uh, influence at all. So if we really want to uh, make it worth it to us to, to, to use sodium hypochlorite, we might want to think, start thinking to take it to a size bigger than a size 25. And I repeat, these teeth in this study were uh, lower molars and lower premolars. And finally, the last study today that will wrap up our last uh, biological factor that I spoke about today is that we want to try to make sure that we're able to deliver our irrigant to a, a clinically, let's say, acceptable and safe working land to let this irrigation agent take its uh, full action. And in a small experiment by Zender, and this experiment maybe comes to complement what Shuping showed in 2000, using a 30 gauge needle, which is the smallest needle today, a side vented needle, which is probably the most used today because it's, it's the, the, the safest needle, he had three uh, blocks one that's instrumented to a size of a 304, another to a size of 3504, and a third one to a size of 4004. All three canals were filled by a kind of, of a red fluid, and then he injected a blue dye, and what we see is that the blue dye was able to go all the way almost to the, let's say, apical area or to the uh, working land, and the 4004 prepared canal. And when we look at a 3004 prepared canal, the apical part of this canal is still uh, contains the red dye. 3504 is really in between. Now, of course, there are a lot of factors in there, probably like a curvature of the tooth and, 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 all, and this, the diameter of the needle we are using. But nevertheless, we can see that using a small uh, diameter, like a 30 gauge, and opening to a decent and clinically ac acceptable uh, apical size, we can deliver our irrigant safely and we can hopefully uh, and we can exert a better microbial control. So this is just some cases that I had to do when I started uh, my residency. Uh, this was back in 2012 at the University of Pennsylvania. On the left hand side, I just started to do some teeth at, uh, with uh, small apical sizes and filling them. And we see that, of course, one, I'm not centered because it's a thing in steel fire. And secondly, the debris that's around the tooth that's left in the canal and not instrumented versus when we look at the right-hand side picture, this was, uh, you, uh, you, uh, the final apical size on these was probably 35 at least, or 40, and we see that it includes a bigger area of the root canal system so that there are less bugs, less bacteria left in there that will eventually cause us less problems in the future. And this is another picture showing a uh, long oval canal. On the left-hand side, I you try to uh, operate, I said, okay, I'm going to try to operate using a uh, uh, cold lateral. We see that there's a lot of debris in there as it's stained by blue, by method in blue. On the right-hand side, I treated this long oval canal as two separate canals. Yes, there are still some areas that are maybe not obturated and maybe that might contain some debris, but overall it contained less debris than using a small apical side. So to wrap up this presentation, uh, what's important to know is that and this is the answer to your question at the beginning of the presentation, that there should be no small or large apical size. What we should be thinking about is optimum or adequate apical size based on the three biological principles that I spoke about, which is one, the morphology of the tooth, secondly, the bacterial reduction that we want to aim for, and thirdly, the irrigation, which will come and complement our bacterial reduction. And when you have, whenever you have, let's say, a regular tooth that's not, let's say, uh, calcified or like with sharp curves, a minimum of a size 35 and an 04 taper is required to be able to really say that you had done your best to be able to uh, disinfect the root canal system. And that size 3504 is what I, sh I think we should start uh, calling as adequate apical size. And so despite, as a small parenthesis, despite all the, uh, all the research out there that, you know, large filing reduces the bacterial count, um, 
we know that, and I just showed you in the first couple of slides that there are a lot of webs and there's a lot of like networks and fins and irregularities in the root canal system. And the best biomechanical instrumentation protocol will always leave about 33 to 49 percent of the canals untouched. As we see in these pictures, everything that is green are untouched areas and everything that is red are touched areas. So the future really holds something great for us and it promises something great. It's called the XP uh, 3D finisher. It's a very special file that not only rotates, but it also has an oscillatory motion so in the sense that it could really spread into all those fins and irregularities, as this video will show it next, in order to be able to better clean and disinfect the root canal system. So this video is courtesy of Dr. Gilberto de Bellin. He is a uh, Penn Endo uh, alumni and faculty practicing in uh, Norway. And we're going to see in a bit how he introduces his uh, XP finisher into that uh, tooth model. And we can really appreciate the oscillatory uh, envelope of motion of this, uh, of this file. It's introduced as a last file after we finish our mechanical instrumentation. And we use it at about 600 RPM. And we really can appreciate how it cleans the canals and even the irregularities and leaves the walls uh, clean. So the future is bright, and hopefully we'll be able to see uh, this uh, instrument really taking more and more uh, popularity amongst us clinicians uh, to be able to uh, better serve our patients. Well, that's terrific. Thank you so much, Dr. Safi, for uh, this excellent presentation. Obviously, I think it's clear from the three factors that you mentioned, um, and Kakahashi's study, as well as future and you know many studies that came afterwards, that the real key here is the reduction and the removal of the biofilm, which is a specific type of uh, contamination that doesn't respond very well to just mere irrigation. And I think that's where sure. this uh, particular file uh, that you're talking about, the 3D file, comes very handy because of the fact that it allows touching of the walls uh, beyond the areas where a round file can touch. Because uh, the Gustafi, as you uh, know, the biofilm does is not just so easily killed with just mere irrigation. You need to physically disturb it. And um, this is why, I think, from what you were saying, why we need to touch the walls as much as possible, uh, if not with a 3D type of a file, but rather with larger apical diameters, you call adequate. Now, I love the terminology adequate because it kind of encompasses a certain, I mean, from based on what you're explained, these three principles are important. Uh, if I may be so uh, bold to, to propose that there might be a fourth uh, principle here, which is the limitation of the instruments that we have, which hopefully the 3D file will, will um, well, address, right? Because in combination course, with course. morphology, right, if you're having a pretzel looking uh, root, it's going to be very difficult to get that up to a size 3504 without breaking the file or ledging the canal in the process, right? So, definitely, what, definitely. so I'm going to ask you in a second what you think about the more difficult uh, curved canals and what are some of the best ways to challenge those to a larger apical anatomy. Uh, because my rule of thumb, the way I always explain when patients ask me what is, not patients, but colleagues ask me what should be the apical size for any given tooth, I always say, as large as possible, as long as it's safe. <laughs> and I think that key safety encompasses, the, the, the term safety encompasses the limitations of morphology and metallurgy and the materials that we have in combination so sure. that we can find that kind of happy, what you call adequate, you know, or optimum sure. sizes for a given tooth. Because again, the principles, we want to touch the walls, we want to be able to get irrigation, but at the same time, the two safe, uh, you know, those two safety limitations are either uh, perforating the side of the root, weakening it uh, by causing cracks and stuff like that, or breaking files and ledging and things like that. So, what do you think? What are some of uh, the um, suggestions that you may have for our viewers for addressing more difficult, challenging, curved, thin roots to, you know, these proposed sizes? You know, the key always starts with a nice uh, and adequate access so that your uh, instrument is really introduced in a straight line into the, your canal. So we have to start by making sure the access is good. And after that, after really establishing uh, like a glide, glide path with your uh, hand instrumentation, 
making sure that you had instrumented to, let's say, a good size, like 15 or 20. What I do is I usually take um, uh, my scout files. It's a kind of, a, or they, I mean, in other companies, they call them path files, but I prefer their scout files. It's a set of files that has a variable paper. Let's say they go from a 1002 to a 1004, then a 1006, then a 1502, then a 2002. Then after that, I start my sequence of files, which usually is, in my case, I like to work a lot with the bioarrays. And why I like this uh, this system is because I can the taper is is is, is uh, changes and they have uh, let's say a final uh, uh, file of a taper let's say a 3502 rather than a 3504 and a 4002 rather than a 4004 and in all in those even curved or super uh, uh, calcified cases I tend to finish my instrumentation at the same apical size of a 35 by using a smaller taper. And we can really play on taper in these cases. It really helps us reach our uh, working lamp safely, adequately, and at the same time not having to take any risk of using, uh, like, say, big tapers and, 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 and breaking the file and, or, or causing damage to the root canal. So that, those are obviously very helpful in terms of having uh, the key principle of having proper access and then having enough coronal opening so you can manage the apex. I think one of the other things is, in my opinion, if we're going to have a smaller size, uh, given sizes for the apex that we want it to be larger, is to also manage the taper. So in such cases where I feel like I have a larger apical diameter, I may, what I may do is I may move away from a, uh, clearly, and certainly, you know, 06 I think is too large for anything as an apical diameter. Uh, I use primarily 04s, but if I feel like I want to go to a larger apical diameter beyond a certain size, I try to move to the race 02 taper files that go all the way to a size 80 uh, 02. And those are wonderful because it allows you now to all of a sudden uh, remove apical dentin without disturbing the coronal taper. Because what I always say, uh, uh, Dr. Safi, is that these files of greater taper remove apical dentin at the expense of coronal dentin. Coronal dentin, and, correct. And that's not something that we want to have because, uh, you know, we don't need to remove coronal dentin. It just weakens the tooth. There's only a certain amount that's necessary to manage the apex. Beyond that, we end up just weakening the root unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. So those are the times where we want to go to a smaller taper file. Smaller taper. Definitely. You know, taper is definitely something we could work on as clinicians to be able to do better uh, instrumentation and safe instrumentation. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I do agree with you on a size 35. As you mentioned over at Penn, uh, you guys have uh, come up with that size 35 as uh, the size that you go with. Our postdocs here at Harvard also have this general rule of trying to get the, uh, the files to at least a size 35. But I always try to just interject my little points always of, well, we got to use common sense. Again, uh, the key is to make sure that, you know, you're having a canal that can bear a 35 that is not looking like a, uh, a double S uh, to the max and, you know, you end up uh, breaking files. So I think these are all very important points that you brought up. And thank you so much for this very educational uh, uh, conversation on this very important topic. So I was joined today by Dr. Shafiq uh, Safi, assistant professor and lecturer at University of Pennsylvania and McGill University postdoctoral endodontics program and also founder of director of Centre Endodontique uh, in Saint Laurent where he practices uh, clinically. Dr. Safi, once again, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, it's my pleasure. For Rewald Enda, I'm Ali Nasser and I hope you found this information helpful.